Horizon, and this is um, Ring Talk. That's great. Forget the name of your own show, Luke. And today we're going to discuss a very, very uh, historic fight in the annals of boxing history. And it's the Max Bear fight. Uh, he was the world heavyweight champion. He's taken on James J. Braddock, June 13th, 1935, at the Graveyard for Champions, the Long Island Bowl uh, in Long Island, Queens, New York. Uh, most fighters went there, most champions, that's where they went to lose their title. Not purposely, but that's what happened. This is a special fight with me. I was in the movie Cinderella Man. And I just want to say that in the movie, after the movie, because I know a lot of people in boxing, and I used to get from very dear friends, I would get these calls saying, how dare you portray Max Bear that way? And how dare you this? And Bear was a great guy. And Bear never said, and I said, I know that. I know we never spoke to Braddock that way. I know all that, but I was just an actor in the film. I didn't write it. So, you know, they just want to get his story out. Bear was not a, a mean guy. Bear, as you see in the movie, uh, and the scene in the restaurant where he's saying all those things about May Braddock, you know, you're too young and lovely to be a widow. I can show you what a real man is. Never happened. Bear was not like that when he was around other people. Bear, Bear was... A womanizer, without a doubt, but uh, he did not treat other people like that. Uh, Max Bear is an also another thing. I've had this argument with people before. Max Bear had a Mokin David, Star of David, on his trunks on the left side, and people said that he was Jewish. He was not Jewish. Father is Jewish. His mother is Roman Catholic. In Judaism, you trace the religion of the child from the mother, because we don't always know who the father is, but you always know who the mother is. Now, this will relate to something I'll say at the very end of the show, a comment Bear made after Braddock uh, beat him. And, and uh, but Bear is born in Livermore, California, February 11th, 1909. And the reason that they used the Star of David is because um, pitting ethnicities against each other meant big business. So people would, would show up. But Ray Arcel, along with Doc Bagley, who was the first two first modern trainers in the 20th century, the guys to say, you know, we gotta, we got, we gotta go running, uh, like they used to do hundreds of years ago, push ups, sit ups, medicine ball, skipping rope, and Ray Arcel is one of those guys who get in the ring and show fighters exactly what to do. As I was saying to my producer Eric Boyce last night, watching. Um, Boots Ennis, who I quite like, against the, the fighter he was fighting from Eastern Europe, whose name I can't pronounce, uh, in between rounds, his father would just say, that guy's a coward. That guy's crap. He's an idiot. He's afraid of you. But that's not advice. That's insults. How does that help your fighter? You have to, A trainer has to give tactical advice to his fighter to tell him exactly what to do in each round. And he wasn't doing that. And so... Ray Arcel was brilliant at that. For instance, when when Roberto Duran fought Ray Leonard, he said to him, get Leonard against the ropes, put your head under his head. And he did this when he beat Kenny Buchanan, lift his head up with your head and then hit him with a shot. Also put your lead left leg, your foot in, in between Leonard's feet. That way Leonard can't move side to side or spin off the rope. So these are the kind of things you tell your fighter that help him win fights. So um, Braddock, Faces Bear, June 13th, as I said, 1935. And, um, uh, yeah, that thank you, Scrapbook. This was at the Madison Square Garden Bowl. And um, Braddock had a record of 66 wins, 13 losses, 51 KOs, 64.56 KO percentage. Not the highest by any means, but pretty damn good. Um, he won the World Heavyweight title June 13th, 1934, to Madison Square Garden Bull, after he dropped uh, uh, Primo Carnera 10 times during the fight. And the referee, the best referee of that era, uh, Arthur Donovan, stopped the fight at the 216 mark of round 11. Now, you know, it's interesting. Carnera, boxing in that era was completely controlled by the mafia. So at that time, you, you had... Um, uh, 1934 is an interesting era because only the killer Madden who ran the sport had been exiled to Arkansas where he ran a resort. And because of that, he still had a bit of control, but it was eventually taken over by Frank Costello, prime minister of the underworld 
Frankie Carbo and Carbo's vicious henchman, uh, Blinky Palermo. And as vicious as only Madden was, where, you know, a fighter that would even dare speak back, you would kill them, their manager, their trainer. Carbo and Palermo took viciousness to a whole new level. But that's another story. So people would say, well, Carnero, you know, he was a mob-controlled fighter. Why would they give the title away to Max Bear? They didn't give the title away to Max Bear. Max Bear won the title, but Max Bear was also a mob-controlled fighter. You don't get to fight for the world heavyweight title in that era unless you're a guy who gives a large percentage of your money to the mob. That's just the way it is. If you're not going to do it, fine. That's fine. You don't have to, but you're not going to get a shot at the world heavyweight title. You just flat out won't. And um, uh, there were a lot of things pinned on Max Bear that I think shortened his life. Like in the movie Cinderella Man, they said, you know, he's killed two men. He didn't kill two men. That's not true at all. He did kill Frankie Campbell, whose real last name was Camilli. He was the brother of Dolph Camilli, who played uh, baseball for the um, Brooklyn Dodgers. And he fought him in 1930, and he knocked him out in the fifth round. And later on, Campbell died of his injuries. What people don't tell you was this emotionally destroyed Bear, and Bear ended up supporting. This was 1930. And for the next 29 years, until he died, Bear supported Campbell's wife and children financially. Didn't have to do that. They had a benefit for them, but he did it anyways, because that's the kind of person he was. He was credited by various writers, who I'm not going to mention, with killing Ernie Schaff. He never killed Ernie Schaff. I actually went and took all this info to a neurologist that I know here in Toronto at Mount Sinai Hospital. And what happened was Schaff beat him in the first fight. Bear clocked him, but Schaff beat him in 1930. So in 1932, they have another fight, and, and Bear um, wins by majority decision. And it was a 10-round fight. He knocked the guy down and, with less than 10 seconds left. The referee got to eight, and then the bell rang to save Schaff, although Bear still won the decision. And they say that's the fight that killed Ernie Schaff. Well, that's not possible because Schaff fought four more times. It's not possible that you would get a catastrophic brain injury and then fight four successive fights and then fight another fight and get hit and die. So uh, this is in my book, which will be coming out, Shaft didn't die from brain injuries. Certainly may have been, they may have contributed a bit, but that wasn't the main reason for Ernie Shaft's death. Um, a bear was a big man. Bear was six, two and a half. And he had a huge 81-inch reach. He was managed by Ansel Hoffman, who had mob connections, and and he was trained by Bob McAllister. You know, he started in California. And the way Bear started was he was basically working on his family's farm with, with his brother, Buddy, who was 6'6", six, six, who also became a boxer. And he would go to these dances, I guess, held in farms or town halls and for some reason, there's always yahoos at these dances. Everyone knows that wherever you are over the world. And he was talking to some woman, and some this guy had his eye on a woman and shoved Bear, and Bear said, back off, and he shoved them again. And then he took a swing at Bear, and Bear apparently put up his left arm and blocked it and hit the guy with the right hand, knocked him cold. And then the guy's friend came out, and Bear did the same thing, and it knocked that guy out cold. And then their third friend apparently had a bit of a, lack of courage and a bit of fit of smarts and decide I'm going to leave that alone. He's knocked out my two best friends with one shot each. Maybe I shouldn't pick on this guy. So it was suggested to Bear that he start fighting. He had some amateur fights around that era, but this was the Great Depression and he needed money. So he starts fighting professionally in Stockton, California, and he's moving up and He's starting to make a name for himself because he's starting to beat more and more and more and more and more um, name fighters. Uh, Jimmy, uh, well, actually, before I get to Jimmy Braddock, I should say Bear had a great overall record um, with 66 wins and only 13 losses. He had 51 KOs, 64.5 per six KO percentage, and Bear, Bear was a guy to be reckoned with. This is a guy that could fight. Now, Jimmy Braddock was also 6'2 and a half. He had 47 wins, but he didn't have as good a record. He had 24 losses with four draws and 27 KOs. He was born June 7th, 1905 in New York City. 
and he died November 29th, 1974 in North Bergen, New Jersey. He was known as the Bulldog of North Bergen. Bear, born 1909, died 1959, I think from a broken heart. He died of a heart attack, but just, you know, people blaming him for killing two men when that didn't happen was heavy on his heart. Um, Braddock had one of the greatest trainers of all time, Whitey Bimstein. Whitey Bimstein is that gnomish bald guy with short arms with the Q-tips on his ears and in his mouth, uh, massaging fighters, training fighters you see on film or in pictures. And he was a very, very smart trainer. And so he's training Braddock, and Braddock's doing well. He's a light heavyweight, 175 pounds. He only weighed 191 when he fought Bear for the title. Bear weighed 209. So Braddock's fighting all these heavyweights, Tuffy Griffith, Jimmy Slattery, great all-timer who he knocked out. And he's beating these guys. And he finally gets a shot at Tommy Loughran. And people talk about... James Tony's one of the greatest defensive fighters or all-around fighters ever. So was Ali. So was Sugar Ray Robinson. Tommy Loughran uh, was, was, is still considered by many people to be the greatest defensive fighter of all time. You know, this was a guy that stood six feet, six one, fought Carnera, who was six six, two seventy five. Loughran was, you know, six one, uh, one seventy five, one eighty, outweighed by like one hundred and five pounds. I had five, six inches on him and still made it a fight, although Carnera just stepped on his feet. But the one thing that Braddock and Bear had in common, they both lost to Tommy Lockwood. And this was, uh, Braddock was 24, and this was his chance at the world light heavyweight title, and Lockwood wiped the floor with him. And there was a point in the fight where Braddock is so frustrated, he's calling him all these names, he's cursing at him. And... Lochran, after he lands a four or five punch combination, says, hey, you know, you still got to be professional. You still got to be a gentleman. Don't talk like that to me. I don't like it. And he, very religious person, Lochran, didn't like that kind of language. He didn't like people fouling or whatever. He said, there's no reason to not be professional. You know, he said to Braddock later, it's just a fight. You know, it's not for the presidency of the United States. It's, it's not for some higher call, just a prize fight. No reason to act like a bum. And not saying Braddock did, but that's how Lochran felt about it. And Lochran won. And where was Braddock to go after that? He was 24. He'd risen up the ranks so quickly. But now he loses to Lochran. He'd made good money, but he invested it in a cab company. And then the Depression hit. So all his businesses tank. And this is the height of the Great Depression. He's got no money. He's got three young kids. He's married. And... He tries to keep fighting, but his loss to Lochran was so one-sided. Who's going to go pay to see him? So he fights some more, a couple more times, lackluster fights. And then he fights a guy named Abe Feldman. And during the Abe Feldman fight, he breaks his right hand. Now, when you break your hand in boxing, it not only prevents you from throwing it, although some guys will. Uh, more importantly, it prevents you from blocking shots. And so he was a one-armed fighter. He was an orthodox fighter. And it just, it didn't, you know, it, the fight was stopped because both guys, it looked like they weren't putting forth an effort. They were. They, they just both weren't. It wasn't Braddock's night, a broken hand. Feldman wasn't that great. So the referee stopped the fight, and they were both disqualified. At that point, uh, Jimmy the boy uh, Johnson, the bandit, Jimmy the boy bandit Johnson, the promoter, matchmaker from Madison Square Garden, recommends to the New York State Athletic Commission that they suspend Braddock's license. Got a broken hand, looked like he didn't make an effort, and they take his license away. And here's the interesting thing. He did this. He did this. And that was a mistake because he did it without the permission of Oni Madden. You see, Braddock's manager was Joe Gould. Joe Gould uh, was an associate of Oni Madden's. Um, that's right. No champion. You're right. Scrap up. No champion ever defended his title successfully at Madison Square Garden Bowl. That's why they called it the graveyard. And Joe Gould worked for Oni Man and doing various things. So when Joe Gould, in the movie, they show him going to, to um, uh, Bruce McCall, the actor, who's playing Jimmy Johnson, and, and Gould's begging for a fight. That's Paul Giamatti, who's a wonderful person. And... Asking to get, you know, Braddock a fight. He's broke. He's down on his luck. 
Didn't happen that way. Gould went to his boss, Oni Madden, and said, what's going on here? Braddock's one of your fighters. You have a large percentage. How are you going to make money off a guy when he's not fighting? Why isn't he fighting? Because Johnson got his license suspended. And so Madden speaks to Johnson and says, did I tell you to do this? No. Well, but he looks so bad and he, he, you know, his, he didn't put up a good fight and he's been stinking out to, and he's, and Madden just, you know, shut up. You don't talk back to me. I'm owning the killer Madden. I didn't, did I specifically say to you to get his license taken away? No. Then why did you do it? You know, and this is a point where Johnson realizes, well, I could lose my life here. He could very well take out a gun and blow my head off. And he said, I'll get it back. He said, you'll get it back now, not an hour from now, not tomorrow, not the next day. You made a mistake. You mentioned the wrong fighter. Call them up. Get his license back if you want to leave the office and make it to your car later. And he gets his license back. And Braddock at this time is going through the worst time like everyone else is during the Great Depression. You know, because his hand's broken. Um, they got to put it in a cast. Didn't heal correctly. Had to break it again. Put it in another cast. He can't get jobs. So he paints his cast black and he goes to the docks and works as a stevedore. And he's making money on the docks. He has to go on welfare, getting $8, you know, for the month. Now, you have to remember, you can get a good meal for a buck back then. But with three kids and a wife, eight bucks isn't going to go far. And um, so he's taking all these jobs he can. He doesn't have the fare to take to go and pay a nickel or, or, or 10 cents for the ferry to New York doesn't have that money. He's got to walk across the bridge. He's got to walk 10 miles to get to the job, do the job, and then walk home. And then when he gets home, there's only so much food, and he gives it to his kids. He barely has any. So his weight starts to go down. Also, they turned electricity off on him. So he had to go scrounging for money. He went to Madison Square Garden and asked all these people. And he said, listen, you know me. I'm an honest guy. I would never do this. I'll pay you all back. And he did. You know, he got money from various people there. Joe Gould, who was just about broke himself, and different fighters and people there gave him some money so he could turn uh, the electricity back on in his apartment and they, you know, the heat, the lighting, have the stove work. And it was it was difficult for him to have to beg like that. He didn't want to. When he started to do well, he paid back all the money. I think it came to $56 or something or maybe more to the welfare people. He didn't want to be known as someone who took it. I'm making money now. I will give it back. He paid back all the people that he borrowed money for it. So from, so he was a very proud man. And Joe Gould is working on Madden, who says, okay, we'll give him a fight. We'll give him a fight. You know what? He's been good. He's been a good money earner. We'll give him a fight. Put him in against John Corn Griffin. Griffin was a fighter from out West, a big heavyweight. Now, the thing about Griffin was he could really punch, but he had no chin. And he goes in against a guy like Corn Griffin, and uh, he, he does well against Griffin, and he he beats Griffin. Uh, June 14th, 1934, he stops him in three rounds. It was only a five-round fight. That was all. But both guys hit the deck in the second round, and then he knocks him out in the, in the uh, third round. Uh, that's June 14th, 1934. A little while later, November 13th, 1934, he defeats the great John Henry Lewis on points uh, after dropping him in the fifth round. And then right after that, uh, March 22nd, 1935, he wins a 15-round decision, unanimous decision over Art Lasky. Three months later, he challenges Bear. Now, there's something people should know about these fights that they don't, that's not commonly known. John Henry Lewis, who he fought, and then Art Lasky, who was a huge fighter, Jewish fighter, six foot three, six four. Lewis and Lasky were blind in one eye. They've been fighting most of their career like that. And Lewis eventually fought Joe Lewis, his best friend, and got knocked out in less than a round. But he needed the money. He knew his license was about to be pulled. And Jack Blackburn, who trained Lewis, who was, in my opinion, the greatest fighting machine that ever walked the face of this earth, said, you don't want to torment him and punish him for the whole fight. Just knock him out early. He still gets the same money. And Lewis did that. So John Henry Lewis, who, by the way, was the grandfather, great-grandfather of uh, LL Cool J, 
I'd beaten Braddock before on speed, you know, hand and foot speed. This time Braddock was different, but it was different for Braddock because of the fact that before it, a lot of it was his ego. I love the money. I love being in the limelight. I'm doing well. I'm beating all these guys. But now after losing to Loughran and the depression taking away everything from him, now he's in a position where a lot of fighters were back then, where I have no choice but to win. If I don't win, my family doesn't eat. You know, I can't say to my to my daughter Rose Marie, or to my sons Howard or Jay, or to my wife May. Sorry, you're not eating this week. I didn't win. I have no choice but to win, because my family needs to eat. And he gets in the ring and he he beats the hell out of John Henry Lewis. Also, you have to remember Joe Lewis, notwithstanding, uh, Braddock had a great chin. Braddock could take a solid shot. So when it came to fighting Max Bear, he wasn't worried about fighting Max Bear. You know, people said he's the big killer. Braddock had taken heavy shots from guys before. It didn't phase him. So he beats these guys. And then the date, November, November, June 13th, 1935, Madison Square Garden Bowl, Long Island City. The referees, Johnny McAvoy, George Kelly, and Charles Lynch are the judges. What's interesting is this was Bear's first defense of the title, and Braddock, who beat him, also only had one defense of the title. And a Bear was a 10 to 1 favorite going into the fight, if you could even get odds uh, on the fight, because it was it's supposed to be a mismatch. It was like the Alley Liston first fight. No one gave Bear or Braddock a chance. Everyone thought he was going to be destroyed. Damon Runyon called him the Cinderella Man. You know, and everyone said maybe, but his pumpkin's going to burst long before midnight. So, but Braddock had a secret. And I spoke to the one of the greatest, if not the greatest boxing historian of all time, the late great Hank Kaplan, who worked for Angelo Dundee. And I surprised them because I'd read up on Braddock and all the fighters from then. I said, I said uh, he said to me, do you know who really trained Braddock and showed him how to beat him? A bear, and I said, Solly Seaman. That's right, redheaded Jewish fighter, Freckles from the Bronx, who was the former world featherweight champion. He's the one that got in the ring because he said, Everyone I fought was bigger than me and punched harder. This is how you beat a guy like Braddock. And, ba and Braddock was smart. He also got Tommy Lochran, who'd also beaten Bear and him, to come into his camp, along with Whitey Bibstein and Ray Arcel. So you have a great brain trust there. And these guys are saying to him, you know, for instance, Tommy Lochran saying, this is, Bear gets frustrated easily. He doesn't like it when someone fights back. And he's going to walk to you in a straight line. And he, he, you know, if you can land punches on him quickly and then keep turning, keep circling him, which is going to force him to turn, he's going to start joking around. He's going to start making faces and, and, and doing poses. And, and that's fine because you're putting rounds in the bank. And it was Lochran and Sully Seaman who impressed on him that you don't have to knock him out. That's not the goal. You have to beat him. And you can beat him by using your ring smarts. Your brain is your most potent weapon. Now, Scrapbook, you said John Henry Lewis was stripped from his New York City crown because he didn't defend his crown against Tiger Jack Fox because of doctor recommendations due to poor eye vision. Yes, but he did get a fight. He knew that, and that's why Joe Lewis agreed to fight him. Lewis fought most, John Henry Lewis fought most of his fight uh, fights blind in one eye. That wasn't uncommon back then. Harry Greb fought blind in one eye. Eye surgery wasn't as perfected as it was like today. And these were starving times. They, they had no, they had no um, uh, special, they had surgery back then, but it wasn't as good as it was today. Now I want to say something about Tiger Jack Fox, great fighter. People say, well, he was he threw he beat Lamata. That was Blackjack Billy Fox. Completely different fighter. Tiger Jack Fox was an all-time great fighter. Now, Braddock, uh, as I said, was born 1905 in New York City, died in North Bergen, New Jersey, 1974. Uh, there was a big weight difference for the fight. Braddock just weighed 194 and and Bear weighed uh, 209 pounds. And it, it's hard to explain 
how stunned the audience were because people were watching the fight like this and they were thinking, oh, we hope Braddock can do it. We hope Braddock can win. But knowing that all Bear, Bear was so strong that all he needed was one punch, one punch to, to knock a man out. That's what keeps him in the fight. Last night, Geronta Davis, I thought, was losing to Hector Garcia and then completely readapted his strategy. And he, because he's very heavy-handed with both hands, the one shot, bang, it's over. And that's the kind of fighter, that's the kind of fighter Bear was. Now, um, I mentioned the people involved. Johnny McAvoy was a referee, who is a veteran referee. He scored the fight 9-5 with one even for Braddock. And it wasn't done today when they announced it. Like, when there's that excitement, this judge scores it, you know, eight rounds to four for this guy. That score eight five rounds to four for the other guy. And then the final judge, it does, they didn't do it that way. They did say these are the scores and the winner, a new champion is. So what happened was um, Charlie Lynch scored 11-4 for Braddock. As I mentioned, Johnny McAvoy, the ref, had it 9-4 for 9-5 for Braddock with one even. And George Kelly had it 7-7 with one round even. But they had a supplementary point system. So although he had it even in rounds with one round even on points, it goes to Braddock. So Braddock wins the World Heavyweight Championship by unanimous decision. And it, it it's, um, as Scrapbook mentioned, no champion who ever defended the title at the Madison Square Garden Bowl was able to do it successfully. Uh, the paid attendance, this is in the height of the Depression, was 29,366, but the gross gate was 205,366.97, and the net was 169,074 cents. Uh, a lot of the money came from the film of the fight. Bear's share was 88,805. Braddock's was only 31,244. But I say only. This is 1934. This was a man who was lucky to get $8 a month. Now he's getting $31,000. And um, um, yes, Al Gaynor was another great. Uh, light heavyweight champ um, uh, from Connecticut. A lot of great fighters from Connecticut. Willie Pep was from Connecticut. Bat Badalino was from Connecticut. Um, I think I probably made a mistake when I mentioned the numbers before because the paid attendance probably was around 290000 would It would not be 29000 That was probably my mistake. Bear received 42% of the net receipts, and Braddock also got 15% of the net receipts on top of his $31,000. So, for Braddock, this was manna from heaven. This was incredible. Now, now I'm the heavyweight champion of the world. So now I get to go on tour in vaudeville. Now I get to appear in short movie films. Now I get all these uh, promotional uh, um, opportunities where I can make more money. And now a guy who was dead broke gets all the money he needs. Um, Interesting thing is referee Johnny McAvoy took three rounds away from Max Bear, uh, the 5th, ninth, and 12th for low blows or backhanding. But the Associated Press said it didn't matter because Braddock won two of them uh, without the eight of the fouls anyway. Backhanding, i got to mention that. You see this in Braddock a lot. A lot, or excuse me, not Braddock, Bear. A lot of his fights, if Bear would throw a punch, he was right-handed, and miss like this, he would bring it back like this, and smack you with the back of his hand, almost like a pivot punch, which was outlawed. You're not allowed to do that. But he did it all the time. He hit he hit Braddock low. Braddock was fighting from a, a crouch at times, and he landed foul blows. And every time he did, he would just go, and he would go like this to the audience. And then he'd go with his other hand, and then he would bow. Or he'd make, fa he'd make faces like that. You know, or he'd turn around and wiggle his rear end. I mean, he was joking. And every time he get to the corner, his corner, his manager, Ansel Hoffman, would say to him, what are you doing? This is the heavyweight title. Max, this is why you have what you have. This is your house. This is everything. You have to win this. If you don't win this, your money goes down 90% for every successive fight. You must beat this guy. You can beat this guy. Stop clowning. But... Lochran, Tommy Lochran, and Whitey Bimstein and Ray Arcel and Solly Seaman, they all knew when you frustrate Max Bear, you get him off his game. That's the whole point. That's what you want to do when you fight another fighter. 
you want to disrupt the rhythm. When Ali beat Liston the first time, the goal going in, is, as Angel Dundee told me, take away Liston's jab. Everything for Liston comes off the jab. So Muhammad took away his jab. How did he do it? Movement, moving around the ring. Kept moving with his feet and kept popping his jab. And if Liston can't throw the jab, he can't get his other shots going. If Max Bear is frustrated and can't get into a rhythm, he can't fight his fight and he's not going to win. Inside him, something will quit. He'll say, what the hell? And that's a lack of discipline and a lack of focus. Now, everyone experiences that. I'm a writer. So there's some days when I'm working on an article and I think, you know what? It's, it's 11.45 at night. I've been working on this for several hours, or four or five hours. It's not there. It's not going to happen tonight. Better I just get rest and try tomorrow. You don't have that option in professional sports, especially in boxing. You don't have the option. This is one reason why I love it, why my producer Eric Boyce loves it, why his father Graham loves it. You don't, it's not like hockey where, where you can change shifts. It's not like football where you can get a substitute or, or basketball where you can go off and someone comes off the bench. You don't get that in boxing. It doesn't matter how tired you are or if you have a broken hand or a broken jaw. You have to fight. That's why it's called the fight. So um, they keep going. And, and the more the more Bear's not doing it on purpose, but the more Bear does this, the more warnings he gets, the more he's out of his rhythm. And Braddock kept circling him. They say it was one of the most boring fights. I enjoyed watching it, but then again, I'm a boring person. So Braddock was hitting with his jab, and then Braddock had an awkward, almost George Foreman-like right hand will come in over the top with Arca's right hand, but it landed. And every time Bear would land on him, he'd hit him right back. But what Braddock's specialty was is getting in, unloading his shots, and then getting away. And then there were times, and this was in the movie, but it happened in, in, in the actual fight where Bear throws a shot and he misses so much, he almost falls down, right? And then he stands up and puts his hands behind his back and wipes his hands in the back of his trunks. And then he tips his head to the audience. I mean, that's what he was doing. And his Ansel Hoffman is pulling his hair out. He's saying, what are you doing? You know, you're losing the fight. I'll get him. You're losing the rounds. And the best way to lose a fight is for a guy to look for one knockout shot. Knockouts come organically. The only exception to that rule, of course, Joe Lewis, and especially when he fought Billy Kahn. Lewis, unlike any other fighter that ever lived, could rearrange your skull with one punch. Bear had tremendous power, or power, but he had to have something to hit. And Braddock wasn't going to stay in range. And even when Braddock was there, and Bear did hit him two, three, four shots in a row, Braddock just shook it off and kept punching back. That's, that was Bear's face. This isn't supposed to happen. That's a problem. See, in boxing, when you hit a guy your best shot, and he's still there, that's the point, you know, that Freddie Roach told me this, where you got to concede the knockout and win the fight on points. Just touch the guy up, put rounds in the bank. But Bear wasn't doing that. Braddock was going in and hitting Bear to the body to take away Bear's legs. And then he kept hitting him in the head. And, you know, in between rounds, Bear was saying to, to Ansel Hoffman, how's my hair? Who cares how your hair is? You know, hit the man, get your hands on. And the later the fight goes, the more, the more desperate um, Max Bear becomes, which is better for Braddock, because a desperate fighter is going to make mistakes and take risks. And when he did, Braddock took advantage of it. Now, in the last couple of rounds, Braddock's corner said, you know what? Stay away from him. Don't give him the chance. And Braddock said, hell no. I can't stay away from him. I've been fighting him head up, even up, like this. Why would I, why would I just run for two rounds? And, and take a chance of getting screwed over. What is it going to happen? So uh, Bear, and by the way, Braddock, um, thank you, Scrapbook. Uh, people said, well, you know, Max Bear beat Carnero, who was a mob fighter. Car Bear was a mob fighter. Now, when I say mob fighter, I have to really make, I have to explain this well enough. I've had some friends say, so you're not explaining it fully, which is true. Fighters that were mob fighters didn't choose to be mob fighters. They chose you. Basically, they walk into your dressing room, put a gun to your trainer's head, and they say, hey, I'm your new manager. And if you say, no, he is, they'll kill him. 
And if you keep refusing, they'll kill you too. They, the, the mob, it's hard to explain them. I mean, it's not hard to explain it, but when someone said no to the mob, it'd be like trying to show your dog another dog on TV. Look at a dog on TV and your dog tilts its head, huh? That's the way the mob was. And someone said, no, you're not doing that to me. Because they never heard no from anyone. No one had ever done that to them and lived. So only certain fighters got away with it. Ray Robinson, but eventually he went with them uh, when he lost all his money. And Basilio stood up to them, although his trainers or his managers had to pay them a hefty fee. So Braddock was mob controlled because of Joe Gould. But Gould took care of him. So this meant, and this happened all the time, where other lesser mobsters would try to muscle in on Braddock or they tried to do it to Jimmy McLaren, and Oni Madden just killed him. It was as simple as that. The best story I heard about Oni Madden was, you know, he was in prison for a while, long time, comes out, goes in again for violating parole in New York. Joe Gould picks him up and he says to Joe Gould, so what's going on? And what he means is, with my rackets. He was a bootlegger, he ran boxing, he supplied linens, he ran the cotton club, he ran the store club, he ran all these different clubs. And Joe Gould Conway says, okay, okay, Oni, but you asked. He said, Dutch Schultz took over your rackets. Dutch Schultz took, uh, assigned this person to your linen, this to your bootlegging, this guy to run boxing, and this guy to run the clubs, four different guys. In 24 hours, all four guys were found in the East River. They were dead. This was only Madden's response. And not too long after, Dutch Schultz was dead. But that was that was to get him from killing the mayor, uh, Dewey, or not the mayor, the uh, district attorney who was going against the mob. But essentially, only Madden was tough as nails. Yeah, he, you're right. He was an inmate at Sing Sing, and he did half his time because the mob paid off people there and got him out early. But Oni Madden, who George Chevallo met and had great, has great stories about, Oni Madden was not a guy to be trifled with. That's why they called him the killer. Imagine that in 24 hours, you, you get out, four guys who took over are dead. And Dutch Schultz doesn't retaliate, doesn't say a thing. That's power. And that's the kind of power he wielded in boxing. So when he said to, to um, Jimmy the Boy Bandit Johnson, I never okayed you getting his license suspended by the New York State Athletic Commission. I want it back now, not an hour from now, not a day from now. This is my product, my property, earning my money. And you take that away from me? And of course, not too long after Johnson was gone, wasn't killed, but he was replaced by Mike Jacobs. Um, so these guys did not fool around. So Braddock ends up, as I said, winning the title. And if you have, I have old, I have the issue here. I haven't been able to find it. As you can tell, this room is a mess. I have two, 3,000 books unboxing and even more magazines. Um, there were 12 photos of the bout in the August 1935 issue of the Ring Magazine, pages five, six, and seven. And, uh, but, and there was a great article on unboxing Cinderella Man by the great writer Francis Albert Canty. Uh, the holiday issue of The Ring in 98 said it was the 20th greatest heavyweight. Uh, um, Bear was ranked as the 20th greatest heavyweight of all time. And that the magazine rated his win against Bear, Braddock's win against Bear, as the ninth most historically significant upset in the history of professional boxing. I think I think the, the biggest upset, of course, was uh, Clay Liston in, uh, in 1964. So... Bear fought listlessly. He didn't, you know, he, he was steamrolled guys. You have to understand who was on his record. He he knocked out Max Schmeling. He knocked out, uh, later on, he knocked out Tony Galento. There was a company called Circle Films. And Circle Films not only get you great, not only great films of the fights, but they had a mic in the ring. You could hear the fighters talking to each other. So when he's fighting Galento, he's, you fat dago bastard. I'm going to knock this spaghetti out of you. I'm going to kill you. And Bear is just pounding Galento, and the fight stopped. And when he fights Schmeling, he says, you Nazi son of a bitch, you're killing my people, you're going to die tonight. And, and it's fascinating to hear this. What's interesting, of course, was Schmeling wasn't a Nazi. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but he despised Hitler. 
and saved people on Kristallnacht. He saved young Jewish kids. His manager, you know, Yeso the Muscle, um, was was Jewish. So uh, Schmeling, you know, lost, but he he would never badmouth Max Baer or anyone. That just wasn't Schmeling. But because of where he lived, unfortunately, you know, in fact, Schmeling even told Hitler off to his face. But because he was so famous, you know, and in that time, the world heavyweight champ, he he got away with it. Um, what happened was was that um, Braddock was smart. He stayed out of the way, landed jabs, came over with solid shots, put combinations in, and whenever he did that, Bear would drop his hands, stick his chin out, and Braddock would hit him. It made no sense. And Braddock executed the fight plan that was laid out for him by Solly Seaman and, and Tommy Loughran, and he thanked them, and, and Ray Arcel and Whitey Bimstein. And he kept hitting Bear in the body with the right hands, but he also constantly kept changing his position. He never stood in one place long enough to allow Bear to get comfortable. And he ignored Bear's antics. He kept landing spearing jabs, and he kept piling up points and putting rounds in the bank. And every time he go back to his corner, Whitey Bimstein did this, and Angelo would do this. He'd, he'd cradle his face in his hands, and he said, Jimmy, remember this, please. You don't have to knock the man out. All you have to do is beat him. That's all. Don't go for the knockout. Don't leave yourself open. Just keep landing points, putting the rounds in the bank, and then you win. By the way, his birth name was James Braddock. The J was given to him by Joe Gould because uh, he thought it would help promote him more. And it was because of James J. Jeffries and James J. Corbett. So he thought, well, we'll have another one, James J. Braddock. And it was Gould who saw him as an amateur and thought, there's something there. There's something there. This guy's got talent, but he's also got spunk. And the crowd uh, was in absolute disbelief watching the fight. The crowd couldn't believe it because they knew Braddock was winning. This was the thing. Braddock's winning, but can Braddock hold the victory? That's what they want to know. Can Braddock last to the 15th round without getting caught by Bear? And they knew Bear could erase everything Braddock had done with a single punch. So every time Braddock connected, the crowd was firmly behind Braddock. And every time Braddock connected, the crowd went nuts. Um, Max Bear was playing a different, a dangerous game. He was playing a game of chicken. And um, people kept saying, why isn't he going after this guy? Why isn't he letting his punches go? And the more he waited and waltzed and clowned and joked and didn't take it seriously, the farther and farther he came behind. He put himself in a position where he had to score a knockout. And that's not a position a fighter wants to be in. He was just giving away the greatest prize in sports. And after every round, his manager said, what's wrong with you? Are you having a mental breakdown? You're the world heavyweight champion. This is a gold mine. This is, this is you know, a right to mint money. You're not going to get any more movie work. He'd been in several movies, The Prize Fighter and The Lady. You're not going to get that. No more vaudeville dates. You'll be the guy that clowned away the title. No more money. What are you doing? And Bear just said, just leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. And so in round six, Braddock Land kept landing tremendous volleys on Bear and then getting out of the pocket. And at the end of the round, the audience started to boo Bear. And Bear was really upset by this. He was really stung by this. and. Um, in the seventh round, he came out determined to get Braddock, and he landed one of his trademark right hands on Braddock's chin. It stunned him, but Braddock held on, and then when he let go, he danced out of out of harm's way. And then uh, Braddock just kept picking his spots and pot shotting him. And eighth, ninth, and and tenth rounds, Bear gave him away. Bear was making faces. He was clowning for the audience. He he was sticking his rear end out. He was saluting the audience, you know, so uh, carrying on a conversation with them, you know, with Braddock. And it was an, it's an amazing thing to watch. You can get it on YouTube. He's not taking the fight seriously at all. And in the 11th round, they said, you know, from here on in, these are the title rounds. You got to win. If you don't win, you're done. So he steps on the gas in the 11th round. But same thing. Braddock hung tough. He hits Braddock with some tremendous shots. But Braddock stays in the pocket and hits back. And Bear's stunned. Bear has this look like this isn't supposed to happen. When I hit a man, he goes down. And he hit Braddock some really good hard right hands. Didn't move Braddock. Braddock had great balance, but he had an iron chin, Joe Lewis notwithstanding. And then 
In the twelfth round, Braddock comes after Bear and lands rights and lefts to Braddock's or to Bear's ribcage and hurts him. And then, as the urgency level kept going up and up and up, um, it, it, Bear wasn't able to rise to the level. The more urgent and the more desperate Bear became, the more he clowned. This is what they had planned for. And the more Braddock rose to the occasion, the more he landed body shots and head shots. The, the, and this is what Tommy Loughran said, the more frustrated and the more desperate he gets, the more he won't fight and the more he'll clown. He doesn't have the focus and the discipline of a champion. And the more you beat him and get out of the way of his shots or stand up to him and show him you can take them, the more he's going to quit on you. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, in the 11th round, Bear stepped on the gas, but nothing happened. And then in the final round, it was close. Both guys were tossing shots, but at half speed, three-quarter speed. And they're mostly body shots. And when the fight was over, Joel Gould leaped into the ring and starts hugging and kissing Braddock, knowing that his guy had won. And uh, it, it was the upset of the century. It really was the upset of the century. We hear about the fight of the century. No one thought this would happen. And Braddock had emerged from, ni from 1929 to 1934 as hell. You know, he he'd been forgotten. He was the forgotten man. And then Damon, Damon Runyon called him the Cinderella man. And so I was mentioning about children before. After the fight, Max Bear was interviewed. And he said, I'm glad Jimmy won. Jimmy's a a real gentleman, and personally, I really like him a lot. He's got a wonderful family, and he's a great man, and he'll be a great champion. Now, that doesn't happen these days. And he said he's got three beautiful young kids. I don't know how many kids I have. I don't know, because I've slept with too many women. That went out over the air, and Bear got in a lot of trouble. The censors went berserk. Now, people that heard it didn't care, but the censors were like, you can't say that on air. After the fight, and for years later, Braddock said that they asked him, you must have been unbelievably elated when you won the title. He said, I was happy and I was sad. I felt very bad for Max Bear. And they asked him why. He said, Max wasn't cut out to be a fighter. He was too sensitive. He wore his emotions at the surface. And he said, when Frankie Campbell died, you could see the life go out of him. And uh, he said it was just the saddest thing. He was, he said he was such, and Braddock was in tears. He was such a sweet man. He was happier for me that I won and what it would do for me than he was for himself. He seemed almost relieved that he lost a world heavyweight title. And so after this fight, Braddock doesn't fight for three years. He hangs on to the title. You know, he gets all these promotions. He goes into vaudeville. And then there's a young man coming up named Joe Lewis. And Braddock was signed to fight Schmeling, but because of what was going on in Germany, they were afraid that Hitler would steal the heavyweight title if Schmeling beat Braddock, which could happen because Schmeling was a former world champion and a great fighter. What would happen then? And then we wouldn't see the heavyweight title again until after the war, if we saw it again at all. So what happens is he signs a contract to fight Schmeling, but he breaks it. Joe Gould breaks it, doesn't matter. Gould's got Oni Madden, but by this time Oni Madden's in Arkansas, but he's still exerting influence. And via Carbo and Palermo and John Reed Kilpatrick. And so what happens is he breaks the contract and he signs to fight Joe Lewis. Now, Joe Gould knows Jimmy Braddock can't beat Joe Lewis, right? Braddock's 34, but he's got... An, He's got an arthritic right hand. He's got arthritic ribs. And he just, you know, he he can't bring his left hand all the way up because his arm is arthritic as well to defend himself. And against Joe Lewis's right hand, that could be fatal. So he makes a deal. He sits down with Mike Jacobs, the promoter, now the promoter at Madison Square Garden. This was what was interesting. Um, uh, Jimmy the Boy Band of Johnson, the promoter and matchmaker for Madison Square Garden didn't want Lewis to fight there because he was black. Didn't know his trainers were, or managers were black and said, you're, you're using the N-word, is going to have to lose. And he said, no, he isn't. So they hooked up with Mike Jacobs. Johnson had the garden, but Jacobs had Lewis, the biggest draw in sports. So Lewis 
ends up challenging Jimmy Braddock in Chicago. And before the fight, Joe Gould says to Jacobs, we'll give you a shot at the title, but we want 10% of all of Joe Lewis's future title defenses. And Jacobs extends his hand and Gould says, uh-uh, got to be in writing. And he said, I'm not doing it in writing. And said, well, then you don't get a shot at the title. Gould said, it's got to be in writing. And Jacobs had mob guys with him too, but they had it in writing. It took them forever to get the money because Jacobs was also a swindler and didn't want to give it to them. But um, they fought in Chicago in Comiskey Park. And, and in the first round, Braddock knocked him down, knocked Joe Lewis down with the right hand. And, you know, his trainer, Whitey Bimstein, said, listen, this guy's a, this guy's ferocious. He's a war machine. You know, so why not go after him? What have you got to lose? What are you going to do? Stand back and let him beat you to a pulp? And he comes out, and, he, and Lewis isn't ready for it. He didn't think Braddock would do that. And he knocks Lewis down. It's a legitimate knockdown. Lewis gets up, has trouble getting his balance, falls into the ropes, but he's there. And then Braddock tries to finish him off. He can't. But after the first round, his trainer, Jack Blackburn, says to Lewis, why did you get up? And he said, what do you mean? You should have stayed down on one knee for the full count of nine and gather yourself. You think getting out quicker means no one saw the knockdown? It doesn't work that way in boxing. You know, and don't take this guy lightly. This is a world heavyweight champion. He beat Max Bear. He knows what he's doing. He said, wear him down. And because he knew he had problems, arthritic ribs and arms, he just started to hit him to the body. And Lewis's speed and power took over. And finally, in the eighth round, he throws a jab and then a right hand, hits Braddock in the face, caves in his face, knocks him out cold. In the background, you see Ray Arcel and I think Waddy Bimstein literally carrying Braddock to the dressing room or to his corner. Lewis called Braddock the bravest man he ever fought, and he always called him champ when he met him. He genuinely, he genuinely liked him. Um, and Braddock did get did get that 10%. Max Bear, after he lost, went on to fight uh, more fights, quite a few more fights. Um, he lost to Joe Lewis in four rounds. He had the greatest line I ever heard in boxing. They asked him what the definition of fear is. And he said, standing across the ring from Joe Lewis and knowing that he wants to go home early. Also, uh, after the third round, after Lewis had dropped him a number of times, he comes back at a corner and Ansel Hoffman, his manager, says, you're doing great, Max. He hasn't laid a glove on you. And Bear says, then keep your eye on the referee because somebody's kicking the crap out of me. And so he keeps fighting and fighting and fighting. And as I said, he beats Galento. And then he loses to Lou Nova. And he fights some more, and then he loses to Lou Nova again in a brutal knockout, and then he retires. Still a young man. And Bear went back to Hollywood to hang out with his friends, appear in movies. He was in the movie The Harder They Fall. What's interesting about The Harder They Fall was written by Bud Schulberg, who I got to meet. Bear plays essentially himself. He plays a guy called Buddy Brannon, who, who knocks out another guy uh, who dies, who was supposed to be Ernie Schaff, and then fights... Toro Marino, who knocks him out. And I said, didn't that bother Bear? And he said, Bear needed the money, and he was happy to get the part. And and um, he was great in that film. But he dies two two years later. And at his funeral, Joe Lewis was a Paul Bear. James Braddock Lewis was in tears. So was Braddock. They genuinely loved him. This tells you a lot about Max Bear. The people, even the people that fought him loved him. He was, you know, you see after Lewis beats him, there's a lot of clips of Lewis after his other fights where Bear's in the dressing room with him, kisses him on the cheek and says, great fight, Joe. He said, this is my guy. This is my best friend. I mean, that's the way Bear was. He didn't take fighting personally. You know, he enjoyed being friends with all these guys. It was a special community, he thought. And in 1959, when Bear died, um, sorry about that. When Bear died in 1959, uh, he was having chest pains in a hotel in California. And he said, I need a doctor. And the, and the operator said, well, send up a hotel doctor. He said, don't, I'm not a hotel. I need a people doctor. And when the doctor got there, he had died. A lot of people thought it was just, it was too much. The grief of, of Frankie Campbell losing his life and everything gone through and writers still blaming him for it that many years later, even though, and blaming him for Ernie Schaff, even though he had nothing to do with the death of Ernie Schaff. They just never let up on him. And the other thing, too, I wanted to mention to you is the star of David on his trunks. I spoke to Ray Arcel, who was Jewish, and he said to me, Lou, I can 
promise you, when we were in Los Angeles and he was working out at the gym, we, there was this big communal shower. So I can tell you for a fact he was not Jewish, meaning Bear wasn't circumcised. Bear didn't speak Yiddish or Hebrew. He wasn't bar mitzvah. But not every Jewish boy is bar mitzvah. You can't always afford one. But, but uh, when he died, he had been married by a priest. He was The service when he died was by a priest. And he was put in a Christian cemetery. But Bear liked all people. This was 1959. It was a shock because he was only 50 years old. Jimmy Braddock, you know, bought a house with the winnings from the Bear fight and lived in that house in North Bergen for the rest of his life. Raised his kids. He owned heavy machinery, which he used uh, to help build the Varen Sandal Bridge in New York. And he, he worked in construction after. And he said, but you were the world heavyweight champion. And he said, yeah, but so what? I don't like sitting at home. I have to be active with my hands and doing something. And Angelo told me a great story where he went over with Muhammad Ali. He liked to introduce him to former champions. And he goes to his house and Braddock's in his 70s. He gets Muhammad a big hug and they sit down. He said, you're a wonderful fighter and a wonderful person. And Muhammad said, thank you, sir. And he says, "Only one. I only have one criticism. And, and Muhammad said, what's that? He said, you don't know how to throw a jab. Can you imagine saying that to Ali? He said, you throw your jab like this, with your hand like this. You're supposed to throw it with your hand like this, which is how they did it in the old days. But Ali was kind with him, and they joked. Um, Braddock died in 74. I met his children, Jay and Howard, on the set of Cinderella Man, and I should have brought it here from my other room. I have a nice picture autographed by him. Best wishes, World Heavyweight Champ, 1934, James J. Braddock. And one of my most prized possessions. I don't know how much it's worth, but I don't really care. It's a slice of history. Braddock was a great person, and so was Max Bear. Bear was in a sport that he sort of fell into because of his size and strength. And in the end, Braddock ended up doing much better than Bear, uh, career-wise, uh, than Bear, especially financially. But Bear was holding his own, making movies. Bear's son, of course, was the famous Buddy Bear, who appeared in the Beverly Hillbillies. Um, this is a great moment in sports. You can see the fight. And when you watch the fight on YouTube, you just smack your head and think, why is Bear doing this? Why on earth is Bear throwing this fight away? There's no reason for it. You know, it's the world heavyweight title. But sometimes you just don't have it that night. And Braddock fought the perfect game plan, frustrated the man, got him out of his own game plan, and won the world heavyweight title. And that's the way it was back then in 1934. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Scrapbook. Um, I have a new uh, website called uh, on Substack called uh, Lou Eisen's Once Upon a Time in the Prize Ring, where you can find my actual stories that I've had published uh, about this and many other stories about boxing from back then. I hope you had a good time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.